Pouring 101 by Stacy Hoffman. First, you need to open your molds. Take a soft brush, either a watercolor mop or just a regular cheek blushing brush for makeup. Dust out each mold cavity, making sure that it is pristine before you go to the next step. As you will tell in this example for the beginning mold artist, two molds are about all that you can readily handle. Once you get more experience with timing and opening molds, then it is easy to be pouring up to six at the same time. This is a spritzer bottle full of distilled water. You wish to spray the inside of the molds with the distilled water because this will increase the absorption of the water from the clay. Just like using a wet sponge will clean up a spill faster than using a dry sponge. After you've moistened the inside cavities, you need to band each mold tightly together with a rubber mold band. The tighter the fit of the rubber band without stretching the rubber band so far that it actually breaks is preferable. My pouring method uses a syringe. Depending on the tightness of the pour hole, the syringe can cause pressure to build up inside the mold, so tight securing is necessary to avoid flash lines. This is porcelain slip that I had strained into a one-quart mason jar the night before. I'm just giving it a slight stir that I'm taking my large animal syringe without a needle and I'm pulling up on the plunger to suction the slip up into the syringe. This is the four head mold cavity and I'm only pouring three of the heads. So I poured just into the head that I will be using on this side. I allowed the tip of the syringe to drip back into the slip container and then I set the whole thing with the remaining slip in a jar of distilled water. I'm patiently waiting. I have my cocktail straw at the ready. Now I'm using my cocktail straw to blow up into the mold in order to expel the liquid slip. You will know that you have achieved total results when you hear a whistling sound being emitted from the inside of the mold. This means you have emptied out as much slip as you can. Jiggling will also help, so if you don't hear the whistling noise, jiggle a bit and blow again. We've turned the mold over now and we will be pouring the remaining two head cavities. As you notice, I'm pointing the syringe in at an angle. You want the slip to hit the side of the mold in the pour spout and continue forward into the mold cavity. This keeps hard, hard spots from developing on the porcelain. After waiting the appropriate amount of time, which really depends on the humidity of the room you're working in, it can be as little as 30 seconds and as much as 2 minutes. You're looking for the thickness of a penny. A little thicker won't hurt as long as it is a mold that has a relatively large opening. The smaller the opening, the thinner your porcelain needs to be or you will be unable to get the porcelain back out. When I mix this slip up, I'm now pouring, pouring the half scale mold B. For the half scale molds, you want to pour the head torso first. After you've emptied it out, set it aside for 5 to 10 minutes before going back to pouring the arms and legs. The arms and legs are so thin in a half scale mold, if you try to pour them the same time as the head torso, you will either have to open the mold too quickly, in which case the head torso will close. 
that should read the head torso will tear or crack simply because it was not allowed to sit in the mold long enough. If, however, you open it too late in order to get the head torso out, the arms and legs will crack if you've poured everything at the same time. While I'm waiting for it to get to the right pouring station on the half scale mold B, I am going ahead and pouring the Georgia mold and the Edwardian leg mold. When you're pouring larger molds, you need to be sure that the animal syringe that you're using is capable of holding enough slip to completely fill the mold. Trying to pour the mold in starts and stops will result in dwell lines on the inside of your mold. This is also the major reason you moisten the molds first. This will stop the dwell lines which are so difficult to clean off. Now in order to pour the arms and leg molds on B, I am adjusting the rubber band to make sure I'm not closing up the casting holes. I'm taking my syringe, I'm injecting the slip, and please note this is easier than it is looking on this video. I've had to basically turn myself inside and out to make sure that you can see what I'm doing so some of the positioning is a lot more awkward than it is in real practice. Okay, I've cast the legs. I am adjusting the rubber band and I'm now going to cast the arms in the half scale mold B. And notice that because these are very small arms and legs, I'm hardly waiting any time at all before I start emptying. I do not wish to cast these solid because if I cast them solid it will be difficult to attach them to the body later in the bisque stage. Okay, now the Georgia mold is ready to empty. Now notice because of the size of the Georgia mold and it is a long torso with head attached, the waiting time before emptying was significantly larger. One thing you must be very certain when you're pouring this type of mold is that when you blow up in the straw that you very gently insert the straw as far up as you can without scratching the inside greenware because it takes sufficient force to make sure that you blow the slip out of the head cavity and do not have it bottlenecked where the head joins the torso. If you turn your molds upside down after you've blown them out, this will continue to facilitate proper drainage. You do not, however, want to leave them upside down indefinitely. Leave them upside down for about five minutes, then turn them right back up so air can circulate freely inside the mold and encourage the greenware to release from the plaster. This is the Edwardian mold. We let it drain back into our slip container, letting you see the thickness that was accumulated there. Refilling our syringe, please note this takes a significant amount of force because you are fighting the natural suction. So don't panic if it doesn't come easily the first time around. With the Edwardian mold, because the legs are almost as close to opening as the hip section, I do not wait long before pouring the legs usually just a minute or two and then I will pour the legs and empty them. Yep, now it looks like it's the right time. And as the porcelain begins to come down into the plaster as it is absorbed, the actual pour level will decrease at the pour spout so you can see the actual thickness that has been accumulating on the inside of the plaster mold. It is this thickness that you use to judge whether it's time to empty a mold or not. Okay. 
Okay, now we're getting ready to try and open the molds. This is a plastic paint spatula that you buy at an art or hobby store. Now what I try to do, because these molds are so small, I don't actually try to ream the pore holes out. I just use the tip of the plastic spatula to gently ease the very top of the pore hold away from the side edges of the plaster. This encourages it to open easily. You do want to make sure if you've had any porcelain slip spills along the side seams of your mold that you clean those out before trying to open the mold. Now you very gently rotate the mold as you hold it together, tapping it against the table. This is a wood table with a laminate top which is perfect for pouring molds as you can easily clean up slip. Now when you're opening the mold you gently wiggle both sides and with gentle wiggling you ease it apart. If gentle wiggling is not sufficient to remove the two mold halves from each other you need to set the mold aside longer. Okay, you want to ease the greenware out of the section of the mold that it is still within with a gentle back and forth wiggling motion. If it is a longer piece you want to be sure that you move up and down the piece and wiggle each section separately so you're not putting undue stress on any one piece of the greenware. You can either remove it as a whole and cut off the spare or you can take a scalpel, which is what I'm doing here, and cut the pour off in the mold and remove the pour spout in one section and then remove each limb separately. It's just a matter of personal preference. I have found, however, that when you are talking molds that the arms or the legs all go up into one pore spout. You get a nicer, cleaner job if you cut the pore spout in the mold before removing the arms and legs. You want to clean off the loose stuff from your area and take your soft brush and brush out any loose stuff before rebanding the mold. Back to opening more molds. If you are pouring in one session, you do not have to re-moisten the mold each time. As long as you're pouring within 15-30 minutes of the last pour, your mold will have retained enough moisture to absorb slip properly. That mold did not quite want to open yet, so I set it aside. I'm trying the next mold. I'm doing the gentle wiggle, and yes, this one wants to open. Now notice as I'm going to fool with this one to get the front and back out, I'm wiggling gently. It's not wanting to come, so I'm going to set it aside and let the top air dry. Basically, when you're trying to remove greenware, it takes a very delicate touch. Too much force will cause distortion and your piece will be ruined. I'm pouring the half scale mold B again. If you tap the mold slightly after you've poured it, it will make sure that the slip goes down into all the cavities. This isn't quite so crucial on larger dolls, but on the smaller pieces, every bit helps. Now the slip, when I prepared it the night before, all I did was take the gallon containers, mix them thoroughly with a wooden spoon, and held the spoon up if I got an easy, ready running off of the porcelain. I simply decanted it into a quart container. 
better quality slips will not have chunks and slumps that need to be drained out before you use it. If you do happen to have a slip that does seem to have chunks and bolts in it as you stir it, you will need to strain it through a piece of nylon stocking and I usually attach the nylon stocking with a rubber band around the top opening of the gallon of slip and drain from that into your quart jar. Here I am trying to remove the Georgia after it's dried a bit more. I'm gently wiggling, moving back and forth along the long torso. And I'm holding it and I'm whapping it in order to get it out on the back side of the mold. I'm now using a cotton q-tip to clean off the little mold little slip flex that have formed along the sides of the mold lines. Okay, we're using our brush. We're going to brush it out completely. Clean our area. I'm using the plastic spatula to clean the area. Okay, we're taking the other half. We're taking our Q-tip again. And this will be used to clean off little pieces of slip that form along the seam line. We're dusting off all the excess with the soft brush. And then we will be ready to reband the mold for pouring again. Notice on these longer molds I will use more than one rubber band. This will produce less seam lines in your finished piece. Now I'm going to go back to the leg mold and I'm going to see if it would like to open this time. Gently tap, turn over, nope, not ready. So I'm merely setting it aside and going on to the next piece. Now this is the second method of pouring B. If you find that you are not good enough at timing to pour a half scale piece all at once, you can pour just the torso, remove the torso, and then go back and pour the arms and legs separately. This takes some of the timing issue out of a half scale piece. It opens nicely. I'm going to use the scapula to cut off the pour spout at the top of the head. And now it will be time to try to gently wiggle the doll out of the back of the mold. And there we go. Now when you remove the piece you can set it aside and try to trim out the holes that need to be trimmed out on a torso or you can go ahead and do it now. It's really a matter of personal preference. I use a scapula blade that is curved and it has a sharpened edge on the inside of the curve and a sharpened edge on the outside of the curve. So I can use it either backwards or forwards. I'm taking the point and I'm going into each leg and carving out a hole. Because I'm using the peg method of assembling the half scale children, this hole does not have to go all the way into the top into the cavity of the torso. It nearly needs to be at least a quarter inch deep so that the peg will have good adherence when I glue it in. You will have to do both legs and both arms. B is an all porcelain little doll. 
and you could, if preferred, attach the arms and legs to the torso using slip. My personal preference, simply because it makes the doll easier to dress and paint, is to attach them separately after they've been fired with pegs made from pipe cleaners. This is a bit fidgety and you need to take time to do this step correctly so that when you peg the doll together it will stay together and not fall apart at a future date. The reason I like to use the syringe for pouring the slip is because of the pressure that I can use with the syringe for forcing the slip out, I can actually get away with using a thicker slip to pour than normal. This has the advantage because if you can use the slip at the viscosity that it was mixed up at the manufacturers, you will have less scum and greenware cleaning problems than if you thin it. If you do decide you have to thin your slip, try adding just a teaspoon of distilled water at a time to your quart jar. Remember, the more water you add, the weaker your porcelain is going to be in the greenware stage. So the thicker you can work with it, the better. The only time that this is not effective is if you are using an old gallon of porcelain. If you are using an old gallon of porcelain, it could have lost water over the years. In this case, you will need to use a jiffy mixer to mix it back up and usually a slip defoliant provided by the manufacturer for their particular brand of slip will have to be added in order to reconstitute it to pouring consistency. A lot of porcelain slips that have allowed to thicken over the years cannot be reconstituted with just distilled water. It's the defoliant that actually allows the clay particles to slide and slip against one another, hence producing slip. Each company makes its own brand of slip thinner specifically designed to work with their porcelain formula. It doesn't hurt to try as much porcelain from different companies as you can. Each will have its own pouring and cleaning feel to it, and you may prefer one slip over another. I have used the Silly Doll Slip with great success, and I've also used the Gold Marque, which is also a personal favorite one that I've just been trying for doing white figurine and white gloves is the porcelain slip put out by the Laguna Clay Company. I'll let you know what I think of it after I've fooled with it for at least a month. Now we are casting just the head, just the, sorry, just the arms and the legs on the bee mold as we've already removed the head torso casting. It doesn't take more than 15 seconds to be ready to open, my apologies, not open, but to be ready to blow out the inside cavities on arms and legs on a half scale toddler. And there we go. One thing to remember when you're casting greenware is to try to make sure you can finish all your castings with the available slip color that you have on hand. From one bottle to the next, French Rose may not be the exact same French Rose as it was in the previous bottle. So if you want your arms, legs, and heads to match, they should all be poured from the same batch of slip.
Now remember, it takes quite a bit of force to pull up the plunger in order to suck the thick slip up into the syringe. Don't be afraid to apply it. Now if you noticed how awkward this looks, this is basically because I'm trying to let the camera see what I'm doing. If I was doing this without the camera, I would have set the mold flat against the table and used both hands to manipulate the syringe. All right, leg mold. One more time. Open sesame. Yep, we might. I felt a little bit of a wiggle. Tap a little bit more. And try again. Maybe. Yes. Success. Now if you're pouring a leg mold that has very elongated heels, you will always want to remove the legs first. If the heels are thicker, you can go ahead and remove the hips or the legs first, whatever your personal preference. Again, you're wiggling gently. If wiggling gently is not sufficient, you will want to set the mold aside and remove the pieces later. Here I've removed the hip section. I'm using my scapula and a back and forth sawing method to remove the pore spare from the bottom of the hips. I'm just taking my time and any ragged edges I will take a cotton swab, dip it in the distilled water, press out the excess, and use the damp but not wet cotton swab to smooth any ragged edges left by the cuddle, cutting removal of the pour. I'm gently rotating the piece in my hand in order to have better access for the cutting line. Now it just depends on the personal touch that you have as to whether you will want to cut the spare off immediately after removing the greenware or if you want to wait three to five minutes and let the porcelain firm up a little bit more. Really and truthfully it is simply a personal preference. Now while I was doing that the Georgia mold was setting up and is now ready to empty. And the more practice you have, the more you can stagger opening and pouring molds so that you have no wasted time during your pouring day. Now I am cutting a hole in the top of the hips at the waist where the pipe cleaner is going to run through in order to attach the torso and the arms. Again, any ragged edges can be smoothed with a damp cotton swab. Large animal syringes can be attained at your vets or at feed and livestock stores. If you do not have any of those in your area, there are several good veterinarian supply companies that sell over the internet. Always after you've finished removing the greenware, take a cotton swab and remove any excess chunks. The wiggling motion that is used to remove the greenware from the plaster is a matter of touch. If you feel the porcelain trying to distort as you're removing it, 
then you are using too much pressure. Porcelain cannot be successfully distorted in the greenware without cutting and splicing. Any attempt just to bend has a tendency to weaken and crack and break at a later date. You can use slice and dice methods to move arm joints, wrist joints, knee joints, etc. I will show how this is done in pouring 102. It is a bit of a pain. It makes a mess in the greenware for cleanup. But sometimes it is the only way to achieve the piece you made if a mold is not available. I'm taking my scalpel and carefully remember removing the pour. Rotating the piece as I'm going around cutting. The scalpel is held at a right angle to the surface of the porcelain. This is the angle that you will need for removing most pour spouts. On rare occasions you will want to use a tapered angle for more advanced porcelain casting. Going back to mold cleanup. The cotton swab you're using for mold cleanup is a dry swab, not a moist one. The main art of mastering pouring porcelain is simply practice. Humidity is the one part of your environment that can change how your porcelain castings act and react to the atmosphere. This pour day, my ship captain's thermometer said it was 75 degrees and 40 percent humidity. At this humidity, I do not have to respray the molds between each casting. If I lived in a desert environment where the humidity was close to zero, I might find it necessary to respray the molds before each casting. On the same token, if you live in a high humidity area, you may not need to spray water into the molds more than once a week if you're pouring every day or every other day. My molds have a tendency to dry out because I'm only cast four to five times each month. Okay, we're doing cleanup on the outside of the mold with the plastic spatula. using the edge to remove the greenware out of my work area. Loosening the pour spout on each end. And like I said previously, I'm not trying to actually remove the pour spout. 
I'm simply trying to loosen it from the top edges of the mold. This is different than a lot of ceramic casting where you're actually removing the pour spout before you remove the item from the mold. Gently tapping, wiggling, wiggle some more, and yes, success, it's opened. Okay, I'm going to use my scapula to cut off the pour spouts within the mold. Then I will remove the pore spouts by flicking them backwards out with my scapula. And then I will wiggle gently to remove each limb from the mold. Cleaning the mold, ready for the next pour. Now if you have noticed, I use just the scapula blade. I do not attach the scapula to the handle. This is a personal preference. It's just easier for me to see what I'm doing without the handle in the way. This is, however, a personal preference. I like the disposable scapulas simply because they're relatively cheap. And I open a want new one for each greenware cleaning session. Things simply work a lot better with a sharp scapula. Now the other method being shown here is to remove everything in one section and cut the pore spouts off separately. It will really depend on your personal preference which one you like the best. It can even differ from one mold to the next. A lot of pouring is trial and error. See what works best for you, the slip you're using, and the humidity conditions of the area you live. The higher the humidity, the longer you need to leave the porcelain in your mold before emptying out the interior and blowing it dry. The drier areas you can be ready to empty almost as soon as you pour. If you find that time is too short, saturate your molds with the distilled water with several sprays right before each pouring. In really dry areas, this will give you the time you need to empty the interior of the mold so you will not end up with a solid casting. Now one thing to remember after you remove the greenware castings is you will need to put them in a slow dry box. To make a slow dry box, take a cardboard lid no more than two to three inches deep. Line the inside with soft white cotton t-shirt material. An old t-shirt works nicely. Lay the trimmed greenware items onto this soft cotton layer and then top with another soft t-shirt. This keeps your greenware from drying too quickly. Drying too quickly can cause cracking. It can also cause a surface scum on the top of the greenware that can be very difficult to clean off without obscuring the detail of the sculpture. Okay, now we're going to open, I believe this is the Georgia mold. Again, I'm using just the very tip 
just to ease that top part of the pore hole away from the plaster. Removed both bands, did our tapping, then we gently wiggled, and yes, we have successfully opened the mold. Now if it is a really long piece, you can wiggle with both hands at different ends to remove. Now because this one is going to be used as a doll, I'm going to take the scalpel and cut the pore spout flush with the lower edge of the hips. If I was going to make this as a Christmas ornament, I would have cut off just the first quarter inch of the pore spout. So I would have had something to build the ruffled lace framework on. Taking my cotton swab, I'm pressing out the excess water on the back of my hand, and using it to clean the ragged edges. Don't forget on Georgia, whether you're going to use her as an ornament or a doll, you will need to cut the pore. You will need to cut out circles under the arms, so that you can attach the lower part of the arms to the torso. I use a gentle sawing motion with the scalpel blade, not a slicing motion, as I find I have less distortion in the greenware when I do this. If you find that the greenware is so soft it's wanting to poke and pull as you use the scalpel, set it aside for five minutes and then go back and cut the holes. I usually set the greenware to one side, reband and clean all the molds, and then take the greenware and move it to the dry box. So at max, the greenware is out in the open air about three to five minutes before being put into the dry box. When you are putting heads and torsos into the dry box, you will have better and more even drying if you put them face down against the bottom layer. If you've ever had a head develop that white salty looking crust on the very tip of the nose, which is next to impossible to clean off successfully, this is the way to avoid that happening. If you're having to re-blend your porcelain slip with defoliant, be very careful to follow the suggestions by the slip manufacturer, as too much defoliant can cause hard crusting on your greenware. It is a fine line between just the right amount and way too much. We're talking the difference of drops. If you need a custom color, it is perfectly alright to mix different colors 
from the same porcelain manufacturer in order to achieve a custom blend. Just be sure that you've mixed thoroughly. Drain into a quart container and then mix again. If, however, you are mixing porcelains from different manufacturers, it can change the inherent reaction of the porcelain, which either may or may not be a good idea. As porcelain can be pricey, it helps to experiment with small amounts before you commit yourself to mixing two gallons together. If you dislike the idea of tapping your mold against the table, perhaps you're using a harder work surface than I am, you can purchase a rubber mallet at the hardware store and use it to gently tap around your mold. So if you're working on a marble table, a glass table, or another hard, hard surface, this might be better than tapping the mold against the poor table. I'm simply trimming the greenware again. Both the top hole at the waist and I will have to trim off the excess pour spout. The other thing to remember when you're ordering porcelain slip or you're restoring it, a lot of slip manufacturers slip cannot be subjected to freezing conditions. It will ruin the consistency of the slip. So be sure when you're ordering that you ask is this slip susceptible to freeze problems. Uh, the Ultra Chick brand is supposed to be able to survive freezing with no adverse side effects. It's not a brand I've had a chance to play with. It's by the Porcelain Palace. But usually the sales representative that you're ordering the slip from will know. And if you buy several gallons at a time, be sure that you're keeping them in a relatively temperature stable area. As extreme heat will cause water evaporation, especially in a porcelain gallon that's already been opened and closed a few times. It is beneficial if you're only pouring just a few things at a time and months are spaced apart that when you open your gallon of porcelain slip and stir it up you decant it into several different quart size mason jars. Close each mason jar firmly and then take rubber tape and tape all around the outside lid to make sure you have an airproof joint. If you do this, the porcelain will still be liquid and usable years afterwards with no waste at all. And this concludes this 101 segment of pouring. Later today I will work on segment 2 which has more advanced casting techniques. I hope y'all enjoyed this and it gave you some insight on what it means to cast in poor porcelain.
This is your teacher signing off. Have a great day.